Welcome to In the Pages. I'm Tax Notes Executive Editor for Commentary, Jasper Smith. And I'm here today with Allison Christians, the Steichman Chair in Tax Law at McGill University in Montreal. We're also proud to say that Professor Christians is a longtime contributor to Tax Notes and author of a column called The Big Picture, which appears regularly in Tax Notes International. So welcome, Allison. It is great to be here, Jasper. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks so much to you for taking the time to talk with us today about an article you wrote recently on writing good papers in law school. You know, as, as a publishing organization, and I speak for myself and the commentary team here at Tax Notes, we certainly are always interested in, in anything that promotes quality writing. So we're excited to have you on to discuss not just specific points from the article, but writing in general. Well, it's one of my favorite subjects, writing. So writing about writing and talking about writing about writing is kind of a meta, great, fabulous thing, a way to spend our time. Thanks. Excellent. Excellent. So to get started, can we just have you tell us a little bit about what led you to write this paper on how to write good papers in law school? All right. Well, this is an easy one. So it's a good place to start. So obviously, you know, I'm a professor, so I profess a lot. Uh, and what do my students do? Well, they write a lot for me. And so every year I have students writing, writing for class, writing term papers, wanting to write thesis uh, papers to some doctoral students who have to write basically a book, uh, you know, over the course of several years. So writing is something that is just part of teaching you're reading papers all the time. So I actually started writing this little thing about writing uh, in response to, you know, kind of common things I was saying over and over to students. It's like, okay, okay, I keep telling you the same thing. I keep saying it again. And so eventually you just think, okay, I need to just maybe explain this in writing. Uh, and then, you know, it's one of those things where you start, you can't stop then because you, then the next time, the next crop of papers, you add something else to that and you add something else. And pretty soon you have kind of a full, uh, almost a manifesto of, uh, well, one could call it rules for good writing, but it's also almost the opposite. It's uh, here's what to avoid, some, some traps to avoid. Well, it's certainly a great article. And I know reading it myself, I was thinking, do I do that? So I, I think it goes beyond law school. We all do uh, have these ticks. We all have these things that we do in our writing. And I think part of it is just a recognition of, oh, I do those things. Do, do I mean to do those? Is this a, something that I'm doing intentionally? And if not, then maybe I want to change it. It doesn't necessarily mean it's terrible. No, and I think it's always good to go back, no matter how long you've done something, and just kind of reassess what, what I would call is the fundamentals. Uh, yeah. included a lot of that. Yeah. So for those who haven't had a chance to read it, can you give us a quick recap of the paper? And, and if you want, maybe highlight some main points uh, that, that you want people to really hone in on? Yeah, well, you know, it's pretty basic. It's, uh, it's uh, style, it's substance, it's uh, a little bit of don't do these things. These are maddening uh, writing ticks. And some of it is kind of assurance, really, that you have a process, you might not realize what your process is and having some recognition of your process will help you improve it. So I just start off, you know, well, you can see that there's a little table of contents and it gives you structure first and then substance and then style. So this kind of lays out in my mind, you know, if you're gonna only work on one thing, work on structure first. Uh, and if you get structure down, then, then it's time to move on to the substance, make sure that your argument is, you know, complete and accurate. And then finally, the style, you know, is to get that writing to the next level. So I would say um, it's, you can start at the beginning and if you only get through, like the first one is organize your argument. If that's the only thing you get through, please at least just do that. And, and you will find that once you do that first step, that first step is the hardest one. Uh, once you get past that first step, the next step is a little easier. And I think as you go, they get a little easier until the very end. And now we're just talking, make it aesthetically pleasing. And that's easy to do relative to the first one, which is organization. No, I, I saw that as well. I, I really appreciated it. You, you kind of wrote it. For, the first thing I saw as a recurring theme was keep reading your article over and over again. And as you do hone in a little bit more or, or kind of funnel it down, 
into these points and, and get more and more precise and improve it with each pass of the article. But, and I think, you know, why are we doing that? Like, who, who cares? Why am I not telling you to read and write, uh, write, read it again and edit again and so on? Like, why are we doing that? Is, why am I saying organize your argument? You know, it's because the big project of writing is communication. And I really want students especially to understand that when you write, you're speaking uh, ideas to the universe and you're learning as you go and what's the product of that what are you trying to say and unless you work on how you communicate you um i think can leave some very unfinished ideas in the universe and so a lot of this is just trying to teach students that the way you get to be a better writer is to to be an effective communicator is to re visit and think about the way you're putting those ideas together and try to think of it from the perspective of the reader you know the poor reader who has to work so hard if you decide not to if you say i'm i just i have so many ideas here but i can't get it together i can't figure out what the thread of this is oh i'll just put it all in the paper and the reader will figure it out well no thank you i'm saying on behalf of readers everywhere you know not interested in trying to figure out what your argument was for you that's your job as the writer and i think really that's the motivation here in basically all of the you know the, the particular rules I, I think that that's fantastic and i think kind of the the underlying theme there is simplicity right the, and, and, and as you wrote in your book and i think you cited to to shrunken white's elements of style and i always remember omit needless words omit needless words yeah. so yeah yeah, yeah so I mean, that, in life too, right? I mean, it's sort of the, the harder the argument is, the more complex the idea is, the more important it is to figure out how to say it in a way that your reader can understand it so that they don't have to spend so much time parsing what you're saying, but then can, you can lead them through to the conclusion you're trying to take them to. Because don't forget, this is for law students, right? So what is law? You know, what is the practice of law? Well, it's persuasion. And so you're goal in communicating is to be persuasive in the things you say so that people will want to agree with you, uh, especially judges, uh, deciders of your fate. And in tax law, that can include, you know, the Internal Revenue Service or the, in Canada, the Canada Revenue Agency, right? It can include a decision maker that, you know, isn't ready to hear your beautifully constructed uh, legal argument, but is ready to hear you say, well, this is really simple. Let me make it easy for you that is kind of uh, there's a gift to that and if you can hone your skill at that i think you can become a really effective advocate no i, I agree with that 100 percent. that the most talented uh, communicators both in writing and in speaking are the ones that can take a complex issue and as you mentioned Simplify. Yeah, I mean, let's face it. Look, I'm a lazy reader. I don't want to work hard when I'm reading. I, you know, that's, I don't want to struggle through it. I want it to be given to me. I don't want to go in the kitchen and make the meal. I want the meal to be served to me on a plate and for it to make sense and to be beautiful and delicious in the case of a meal. And of course, I'm breaking my own rule right now in using that metaphor, you know, C rule, whatever, don't use too many metaphors. We could talk about that a little bit more. But the idea of, uh, you have to think of your reader as totally lazy. Like we don't want to work hard to get ideas. We are inundated with ideas in the world. So if you make it hard for me to figure out what your idea is, I'm going to lose interest almost right away. I'm going to start thinking about something else. I'm going to start doing something else and you've lost me. You'll probably never get me back. But if you make it easy for me and you just, you know, lead me right to it and you just give it to me little small pieces, uh, easy for me to follow. And I'm going to start nodding and going, oh, this is interesting. Okay, I'm with you, I'm with you, what next? And that's where you want your reader. You wanna you know, keep them interested in the story you're telling. Yeah, so based on what you're saying, you, you can make it easy to read or you can make it easy to put down, right? Which one, what is your Exactly. Goal? Yeah, which one do you want? You know, and like, look, I, we're in tax, so we know how easy it is to put that down. There's you know, a thousand things more interesting to read than the latest article on you know, technical services or whatever. There's a thousand things that are gonna be more interesting to read in terms of the headline news than you know, plowing through hundreds of pages of regulations. So we all know what bad, read, uh, bad writing looks like. We all know intimately what bad writing looks like. 
when you're trying to figure out what ideas you'd like to put in the universe, you know, you have to be thinking, well, you know, where do I meet the person where they are? They could go read the headline news, they could go watch reality TV, or they could spend some time with my idea. How do I draw people into the world of ideas? This is really challenging. And I think in tax, you know, the challenge is exquisite, right? It's the world of ideas in tax, it, it, it's just a totally different place than, you know, the headline news story. It's just a technically difficult place to reach people. So thinking about that message, like how, okay, my reader is lazy. They don't want to work through this. So how do I give it to them in a way that they're going to want to hear what I have to say? It's still a challenge for me. Like I'm working on this all the time with every article I'm writing, I'm rewriting on that very same premise. Like, how do I get you to believe me? I'm trying to persuade you of something, right? Right. Yeah. And, and I think I, you may have alluded to this in the article, but the point, the idea of like, I'm, I'm as a reader, I'm giving you an audience. And in speaking, obviously, gestures, tone of voice, kind of enthusiasm can make up for maybe what's not the, yeah. the most interesting speech. But obviously, you don't get that in writing. So. No, that's right. I mean, those words are stark on the page, aren't they? So they really need to work. And there is a tone and a rhythm to the words on the page that you have to be in tune to. If you're not attuned to that, then yeah, you can, well, you've seen, you know, you've seen it. You can see it in my rules, like the long sentences, the ones that don't let you breathe as a reader, uh, that don't let you process information in the time that it takes to read it. You know, those things are uh, impeding the reader's understanding. And as soon as you impede a reader, you, you've lost them. Absolutely. So I, I know it hasn't been that long since you wrote it and, and you mentioned you're just- uh, Well, I've been uh, writing it for 20 years, let's say 20 <laughs> years. <laughs> right, right. Well, I should say published it. And you okay. just got back to school, but have you gotten any feedback yet from students or maybe colleagues who've read it? Yeah, I mean, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Uh, you know, it's, well, maybe the, probably the most popular thing I've ever written. I have lots of great papers on tax law. And I love people to read them, but I think, you know, this is the one that resonates because everybody who writes has the same problem. Everybody who writes in international tax might have some of the same issues or int be interested in some of the same things as me, but everybody who writes uh, regularly probably has some of the same interests. And everybody who teaches, is in the same position that I was when I started writing it, which is you do have students coming every year, they're asking, well, how do I become a better writer? How do I get an A? How do I get a better grade? How do I be a better communicator? Um, and how do I build skills for my practice? And they're, all of those put together here. So I've had fellow professors, uh, there's been some tweeting about it, uh, you know, there, it's, uh, it's risen to the, to the whatever the upper echelons of the SSRN download universe for whatever that is worth. I'm not really sure what that's worth, but uh, you know, it, there's some affirmation certainly. And from students, you know, well, students are a mixed uh, bag. So <laughs> some students love it because they, it's like a key book. It's like a guidebook to how to get a good grade out of me. So just follow the rules and you get a good grade. But some students say that it's too um, rigid. Like, well, I just want to write how I write. And, uh, you know, you're, you can't tell somebody how to write well. And uh, to that I say, yes, yes, true. In a creative writing class, you should not, don't use this, don't use these rules in a creative writing class, I guess. Uh, but you have to remember what the job is as a lawyer. So I think students appreciate having the guidance always and the clarity. They know what I want. Um, and that's unique to me, but I think uh, lots of law professors have kind of a list of things they'd like. So I'm hearing from some that I've hit the same things that they recognize that they want also from their students. So I know it's being assigned in a couple of call, uh, a couple of classes this fall, you know, and I have a handy video, by the way, uh, to explain how it, the last bit of this is on style, and I have a little video, like a tutorial, you know, before I published it, it had a few, couple, you know, some views, and now it's got a lot more views. So I know people are starting to say, okay, the, I can learn something from this as a useful tool. Oh, that's great, and and I think you did a good job in there of of when you started at the beginning, and you might have reiterated it a couple times that you're limiting the scope of the article to specifically uh, 
articles written in law school and then maybe even widening it out to, to legal writing and to academic style writing. So as you mentioned, they aren't really a, fully applicable to creative writing. Well, I have had a couple of people say to me, I don't know why you called that really good rules for writing good papers in law school. You should uh, aim that at, you know, all of your colleagues, you know, all, all law professors should be reading this. I, I don't know. I'm not going to say anything about that. I'm not touching that with a 10 foot pole. Everybody's got to learn how to write themselves, how they want to do it. I, I think I will say that I'm saying <laughs> check as you as well. It's dangerous. I, it's dangerous, <laughs> right? Because it's like being the grammar police, right? Like, yeah, it's true. A lot of law, academic legal writing is impenetrable. I, I find it impenetrable. And therefore, I've, as a lazy reader, I stop reading it. So in one sense, it's got to be right. On the other hand, my guess is anybody who's not uh, in ta like if I send my articles to family members, they don't read my articles and I think they're beautifully written. So, you know, it's not, not necessarily universal uh, advice. And, and, you know, a point we chatted about before the podcast, I, I, to, to the point that you write the way you write or you have freedom of style. Obviously, if you read, for instance, our publication, there are a myriad of different style and authors have a myriad, of, a, a number of voices that they use. And we don't yeah. try to take that away. But there are certain fundamentals that you, you have to kind of, for lack of a better term, master before you can start freestyling. And, and yeah, that. that's, that's true. I, I think, you know, I'm never more pleased than when I see a letter to the editor of Tax Notes International uh, complaining about something I've written saying, you know, Allison is so wrong, or I totally disagree with Allison. I'm pleased to get those because it means the person read it. And they understood what I was saying enough to, to disagree with me and then, you know, come back with something to say. So I need to know my audience for Tax Notes International. My audience is a different audience than the one when I'm trying to write a more general law review paper. I'm trying to get at people who have a certain expertise. I have to speak to them where they are and about the things that they care about. And I can't, uh, you know, dwell on things that I might spend more time on in my own writing that I think are important, but isn't really going to affect where they are and isn't going to appeal to them as readers. So I have to think about that audience. And sometimes that's hard. That's really hard to do. And I think this is like maybe the unstated rule in the paper is if you don't know how to write, then what you have to do is write. You have to write more and keep writing until you figure out, oh yeah, that, that didn't make sense at all. Uh, I wrote that to the wrong audience or I didn't write that in the right way and that audience couldn't, uh, couldn't respond to it, you know, and that just takes uh, practice. But what else does it really take? What does most writing really take? It's that you actually want to communicate something. You're trying to communicate something to someone else, not because you're trying to tell them something that they don't know, but because you're trying to engage. And so that's why I like those letters you know, when they come back, because they're, they're showing me that I have engaged with somebody. You don't have to agree with me in order to engage with me. And write, good writing should be able to create that space for engagement. That's the, that's the great thing about, you know, having different venues to write in. Fully agree with that. And it's interesting that you mentioned uh, the articles that we published, because obviously those have gone through an, an extra layer of editing by, you know, pro professional editors, not Yours probably less than, than, than some, I'll just put it that way. But at the same time, you do have another person who's looking and saying, okay, let me analyze all of the things that you, kind of, that you mentioned in your article. Oh, and you're so grateful for that, right? Because when you get somebody who's professional, who's, a, who's an editor, they catch you where you got a little bit lazy as a writer, where you assume somebody knew what you were talking about or said certain said things in a certain way that you thought may meant you know had meaning a and when the editor read it read it they had meaning b it's clear that you need to uh resolve an ambiguity there i'm grateful for that because you can't get rid of your blind spots as an author you just can't you need an editor and an editor that knows what you're talking about and and is professional and capable but also substantively strong on the merits I, it's like worth their weight in gold is my my view yeah and, and in that regard just just um talking about students in general uh how would you suggest they get that that uh, extra set of eyes if you will is it a professor is a resource 
Ah, interesting. So you're a student and you've written a paper that's for a class. You usually have an audience of exactly one, which is your professor. So yeah, you can be sort of talking, screaming at the void, really, because as a professor, uh, if I have 60 students in a term, the chances that I'm going to do two or three reads of every paper are pretty slim, right? That's hard for me to do. I will try. I will try, but I don't always succeed. So who can you go to? So here's what I would say. Most of the time as a student, you're writing a term paper, not very many people are going to have time or inclination or ability to read it. But here's the thing that you can do to always improve your writing. You can explain that idea to somebody around the dinner table, explain it to your family members or your friends and say, okay, I'm writing this article. This is what I'm writing about. Uh, and then as you try to formulate the words, the first time you go through that, you won't even be able to, you'll have no idea. I don't even know what I'm writing about anymore. I, I lost it. I thought I knew I have this whole paper. It's 30 pages long. I have no idea what it's even about because I can't figure out how to serve it to you, you know, verbally. And, but if you do this a few more times, you will not only figure out what it is you were trying to say, which will help you edit yourself, uh, but you'll probably get some good feedback in terms of how logical that argument is. You may not get substantive, you know, legal feedback, but you will certainly get, well, I don't get it. What, what are you saying? And every time someone says, I don't get it, what do you mean? You know, that's a gift to you because then you get to articulate it a different way. So that to me, if you can't get somebody to read what you're writing, you know, grab them and tell them what you're writing about. And I can tell you, even after, you know, almost, what is it, 17 years of teaching and writing, I still take my ideas home to the dinner table. Uh, my kids are pretty grown up now. One of them can very quickly tell me, oh, I don't like this idea at all, or uh, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense to me. And then I'll have to say it a different way. And that older kid of mine is responsible for more than one of my title changes because he'll be like, why are you, why are you giving so many long words in the title? Just call it blah. So, you know, just, he doesn't know anything about tax or he knows very little about tax. He doesn't know any more than he could possibly avoid knowing about tax, but he can still be that sounding board and articulating your ideas always makes them better. That, that's the wonderful advice. And, and, uh, I would say just probably be careful about how many times you do that at the dinner table. You don't want to be bad yeah, company, but <laughs> I know it's true, you, but no, <laughs> it is true. Like, let me tell you, I never have any illusions. Uh, my kids think I am the most boring. Why would anybody ever want to have a podcast with me or talk to me about anything? Cause there's, I'm so boring. All I do is talk about that. It is a, de there is a definite hazard to that. If you take your ideas to the same people. So, you know, maybe, you know, get some friends, <laughs> maybe get some friends that are sort of basically interested, you know, workshop it a little bit with some friends, some different friends each time. But yeah, it's a good. Idea. Don't always take, don't always take your best ideas to the family dinner table. It can sometimes talk about some other things that would be nice too. That's great. Now, well, I, my experience in law school, there were specific legal writing courses that we took. I think, I think yeah. we have to take two that were more focused on like brief writing, um, mm -hmm. uh, what we might write in practice, legal memos. Yeah. But if there were other classes where there were legal writing, there was legal writing, it was usually, the focus was on substantive law, but we might have a paper in lieu of a final exam. Does, does that, yeah. is that the norm with the way that you're teaching? Yeah, I, I often, I'd like to have a paper instead of an exam uh, for lots of reasons. Well, one thing, if you've ever read 60 exams, uh, by the 10th or so answer, you're sort of sick of the question you asked. And by the 60th uh, answer to your question, you think, why did I ever ask this question? I never want to know. I don't care anymore what the answer is, right? So you kind of get tired of the doctrinal answer to a question model that is the exam structure, right? So the writing is an opportunity for you to say to students, you tell me something that I don't know. Tell me, go look at something that's interesting to you. Bring the experience that you had before you came to my class. Bring the way you thought about the world to that and connect what I'm teaching you to something you know that I don't know. And now all of a sudden we're having a completely different conversation and one that's, you know, frankly, much more interesting to me. That, that makes complete sense. Um, do you know we've talked uh, several times about 
this article being written again as instruction for academic papers. Uh, but do you think there would be different considerations when it comes to papers written for other purposes, particularly again as lawyers, uh, maybe briefs, legal memos, even professional publications such as our hours? Yeah. Well, sort of going back to that idea that, you know, who should read this paper? Should it just be students or should it be people who write professionally? Well, okay. Mm, I would say 90% of it is broadly applicable to anyone who writes. And I think the reason that I would say that is that all writing shares that one thing in common which is that you're trying to communicate, you're trying to engage somebody. And you know that there's one of the things I say is, you know, you to think about uh, what you're trying to say, but also, you know, why are you trying to say it? Are you trying to sound like the most, you know, the smartest person in the room? Uh, and you're trying to take up all the oxygen so nobody else can have a chance to say anything. You know, why would you want, why do you think anybody would voluntarily subject themselves to that kind of writing? And I think that goes across all forum, all, all forms of writing. So if I'm a judge and I'm reading your brief, I want to be persuaded that you're being careful about the things you're saying. You're not exaggerating. You're not leaving out important things or you're not trying to minimize something that shouldn't be minimized, but that you're taking it seriously and that you're engaging it. I don't want to read a brief where uh, you're trying to take up all the oxygen and tell me how smart you are, right? So I think that kind of advice goes across. And right, you know, again, writing, man, writing is hard. It is hard uh, work, it is a slog. You don't write down a perfect sentence. Very few people can write down a perfect sentence the first time. And so the advice to think about what devices you're using to persuade, I think runs across the, anyway, the legal writing area. Now I've had a few people that have uh, contacted me outside of law and said, this is equally applicable. I am in a business, I've had a business law, a business school professor um, in accounting, uh, anthropology, uh, philosophy even, where, and philosophy is a completely different style of writing, but that same message is, is true that you're trying to convey, you're trying to engage, and you're working with a complex set of problems that you must have some reason that you want to say something about it. And so you have to figure out what that reason is and you have to communicate that. That's universal, I think, across. Now, some of the things like, um, I am just personally hate, I, I, it's not too strong a word. I know we should be careful in using this word hate, but I really hate the use of excessive cliched rhetoric in writing. Now we use it all the time. We've been using it in this conversation. I, I use the metaphor of uh, um, uh, being served a meal when I was talking about how to write. So we use metaphor, but it's so easy in writing to use a metaphor uh, because we're as writers too lazy to think through what concept we're trying to express. And so I will often, you know, when I'm reading something, if I see that metaphor, you know, I, for me, it's like a hard stop. Like I can't read anymore. I can't, I just, it grates at me. And it's because I've read so many things with that metaphor. Now, is that universal? No, because we are humans. We use metaphor to express. It's perfectly natural and it's a good thing to do. And you should use metaphor when it will clarify. But it's that sort of cliched metaphor like, oh, it's water under the bridge or we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Or, you know, you've got these sort of tropes that you see uh, in law and elsewhere. And is like, come on, just push all of that aside. And what are you trying to say, can you say it without a metaphor? I think that's very consistent with the overall message of, is this necessary? What does this add yeah. to your argument? Or uh, is it Yeah, clarifying? but I, I can see where that could be considered excessive, right? Like, come on, it, I use metaphor myself. So how can I tell you not to use it and not to put it in your writing? I use it in my writing. So that's why I say it's not so much a rule as, as it's more of a, hey, notice that you're using that and think about it. I, 
are you sure you want to use that? Especially, oh my goodness, especially if the metaphor is gendered or it's racialized or it's historic, you know, it's based on historical, you know, ideas that you haven't really thought about because you can really uh, convey something you don't want to convey if you don't think about that. And I think we have to be careful. I think that you have to be careful about the way you express ideas because you don't want to say things that you don't mean by accident by using an imperfectly conceptualized metaphor. And, you know, at the risk of sounding like I'm wagging my finger at the younger generation, <laughs> I, I, I think that in, in, with an era where people are raised largely communicating via text or via Twitter, you can't overemphasize that. Uh, you can't emphasize yeah. that enough, I should say. Uh, the, the fact that you need to think about what you're writing uh, and why you include each piece. And, and, and even yeah. when it comes to metaphors, the history of it. We've seen people get in trouble for doing exactly that. Yeah, exactly. Let just be mindful. Just be mindful. You could hurt somebody without wanting to. Do you really want to do that with your writing? I don't think you do. I think you're trying to engage. You're trying to express. And unless you're trying to express and engage, you know, really uh, unfortunate thinking, uh, you know, you should don't do it by accident. You know, unless you're really trying to be offensive, then fine, go ahead, you know, do that. And I'm not going to read it. But, you know, I don't, I don't, I really object to the casual use of language that can cause harm uh, when it, all you have to do is be mindful of the words you're using and think about, well, is that really what I meant to say? If not, maybe I can actually engage my audience in a different way that's more effective. Yeah. And, and, and kind of sticking in line with that thought of uh, the changing mediums that people are spend a lot of time looking at and the shifting attitudes maybe towards uh, reading in general how would you respond to critics who might say you know long form legal writing especially in academic context it, it's not as important as it once was yeah uh well that's i would say unequivocally that's wrong it is important um and why is it important why is long form and legal writing important because uh, here's why law is trying to accomplish things that are complicated, really tough. And they involve balancing interests and balancing cultural, social, political, economic, and normative, all kinds of aspects of life, right? So to think that what we should do is get rid of rigorous uh, thinking in favor of something short and you know, Twitter worthy um, is a mistake. So I think of the writing process and the way I do writing as you have to do all of those things at the same time. You have to dig deep into things that are obscure, hard to understand, hard to connect the dots, things about which you don't know, all of the ins and outs, and you have to do some research. You, you have to engage in that stuff. It's a deep dive and it's hard work and it's boring. And sometimes the things you write are not going to be appreciated by you know more than one or two people if you're lucky you know five at the most and then you have to come back out of that and say okay now why was i looking at that problem you know what is it about that problem that intrigued me why did i spend uh time reading through all of that stuff that only myself and maybe one or two i can persuade maybe one or two people to be interested in that and you say okay well actually there is a good reason i'm interested in that and try to figure out what that in, that is for me personally that interest uh, that motivates basically everything i write is the distributive in, in, uh, the distributive impact of all of the rules that we write, the rule of law. So I'm interested in how law mediates uh, wealth distribution, how law produces wealth distribution uh, across uh, and, and within societies. So all of the questions that I ask about, you know, how does this rule work are ultimately trying to work out what are the implications of that rule for people. So yeah, you do that deep dive, you write those long form papers that only two or three or if you're lucky five people will read and want to read and have in their lives then you come back and say okay now what is is there an application of this to every day then there's a tax notes column is there an opinion a frustration that i want to express about the you know the the nature of the universe uh well then maybe there's a tweet or a series of tweets or a blog post is there just a set of information here that people just don't have. Oh, well, maybe I need to make that available through some forum 
that isn't necessarily, I don't necessarily know what the good of that is, but it might be useful to somebody. Let me just get that knowledge out into the universe. So I think you don't get all of those, you don't get the tweets and you don't get the blogs and you don't get the sort of knowledge dissemination idea unless you do that deep dive long form. So is it dead? No, it's the basis for developing nuanced thinking about difficult topics. And that, that is the project of law. I think you articulated that wonderfully. And, and the only thing I would add, you, you, you mentioned uh, in there that it, it is hard, it is difficult, it does take a, a time commitment. And anything that is difficult and takes effort it can be a differentiator for you. Like if, if it was easy, like for life to sound cliche, everybody would do it, right? Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> like this is how you know you're a tax lawyer, okay? I'm gonna tell you, this is how you know. You are the person who, when all reasonable people would say, this question is no longer interesting and I no longer want to know the answer to it, you keep going. That is the moment you know you found your correct area of law to study, in my case, tax. It, you're the one constructing the spreadsheet at three in the morning, you know, putting the numbers in there, trying to figure out how does it work. You're the one still reading through that same statute after every reasonable person would have turned the lights off and went home. You're still there. You've got the right profession. Is it easy? Of course, you know, no. I mean, I think of, I'm sure I can, you and I could come up with on this call 10 things that I could have been good at that would have been way easier than international tax, uh, especially at the pace that it's been going in the last you know, five years. It's hard. It's hard and a lot of it is meaningless. Like, I'm sorry, I really like the transfer pricing guidelines, but you try spending you know, some time with them. It's not fun to read these things. It's not fun to uh, sort through words that don't have any meaning independent of the context in which you find them. And it's not fun to try to find principles in the middle of all that, right? It's hard. But if you are still doing it, uh, when all reasonable people would have stopped, then that's what you were supposed to be doing. And now you've done that, you know something that a lot of people don't know. Why wouldn't you wanna share that knowledge with the world? Get out there and write a paper about it and see what you learn by writing. Yeah, and, and, and I would say that for someone like you who's able to do the non-fun work and then articulate it back in your articles, which are enjoyable, are engaging, and we appreciate that. And, and you've added something, you know, to the world, for, for lack of a better way to put it. Well, look, I mean, that's the goal. So anytime you sit down and start writing, you know, the first thing you're going to do when you start writing is you're going to start learning. And learning is hard work. You have, to, you have to focus on it. You can't just, you know, kick up your feet and start, you know, look at a flower, look deep into a flower and know what to say. That's not how it works. Uh, you have to... Um, Put effort into learning and when you learn then you know something you didn't know before and then you start looking around like huh am I the only one that didn't know this like okay that's possible it could be that everybody knew this and I'm the only one that didn't know but on the off chance other people didn't know either I'm gonna write this out in the way that I understand it and then the worst case scenario the worst thing that could happen is I could be wrong and then hopefully I will have written it in such a way that will, somebody will come back and tell me, here's the three or 10 or a hundred reasons why I think you're wrong. And then I'm going to get a chance to think about it some more and learn a little bit more. If you're not doing that, then there's no point writing. Yeah, fantastic. And, and I, I'm familiar with your writing mostly through what you've published uh, with us in Tax Notes. And, and I know as we talked about, you've published a number of articles in other publications do you mind walking us through, through your approach to professional writing or writing in general? Mm. Yeah, well, okay, so preface this with I'm, I'm old now, right? Like I'm older, I have some experience in this. So I'm gonna tell you how I wrote my first article and then I'll tell you how I wrote the one I did uh, yesterday or whatever, the one I'm working on right now. So the very first article I wrote, I struggled. The first thing I did is I read everything. And I, when I say everything, I'm not being, uh, I'm not, uh, exaggerating. You have to go find everything you can find that people have written about the subject you're interested in. And I can tell you that one of the first articles I ever wrote was about international tax. And I went out and I found, you know, all the articles that had been written on that area. And I read them and I studied them. Like, how is this article put together? And I'll never forget 
sitting in the middle of my paper thinking, I've been writing this paper for six months or nine months. I haven't said anything new. I haven't said anything. I have nothing to contribute. I am never going to be able to say anything as well as uh, Ruben Aviona said in his 2000 article on globalization. I'll never be able to do anything like that, right? And so I went back to Ruben Aviona's article. Was, okay, how did he do that? How did he structure it? Where did he start? Then what did he do? And so it was a long, laborious process of understanding something I admired trying to figure out not just what he was saying, I was interested in that, but how did he say it? How did he put that argument together? You know, what um, facts did, did he marshal? What did he line up? What kind of logic did he use? Uh, Nancy Kaufman, Nan Kaufman wrote one of the most influential articles in international tax uh, about fairness. I went back and I read that article probably 15 or 20 times just thinking about what's the structure of this argument? What does she say and what didn't she say? You know, what did I find? Why am I so intrigued by that argument? What am I trying to get out of that? Uh, then, do, you know, lather, rinse, repeat, do that again and again. The Musgraves wrote a, a seminal work in 1972, which I've cited in one of my tax notes columns. You know, you can't just read that once. You have to read that a few times just to get what's going on. As a non-economist, you know, it takes some time. Then you start thinking, okay, how is that argument put together? So the first article I wrote, I read articles to think about, learn about the subject, and then read them again to understand how those articles were put together. Then over time, I started to develop this ideas about how I put an article together and how I get ideas. So now, here's my process in a nutshell. I'm usually promised I would give a paper to somebody at some conference, that helps, right? Like just having an external deadline, oh man, I said I would write this paper, I gotta write it now. Yeah, you know, that is the terrible, but it's great. It's like you need that uh, external motivator sometimes. Okay, I wrote, I said I was gonna write a paper. Okay, what did I say I was gonna write about? Let's go see, oh, okay, the title is, you know, uh, who should tax multinationals? Oh, it's an interesting title. I wonder what I'm gonna say about that. And so then I think about it and I think, okay, uh, there's a lot of walking, there's a lot of procrastinating, but I get the idea, okay, I think I understand my basic approach. I'm gonna have you know, one argument or two arguments. I wonder how those work together and I'll noodle back and forth, back and forth. And then what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna write the abstract. The abstract is one paragraph, what's the paper about? One paragraph is the roadmap. I write the abstract, what I think this paper's about, I write the roadmap. Then I copy paste the roadmap put it in the body and separate it. So now the roadmap is all the parts of the paper. So part one, I said, I'm gonna do this. So there's that copy of what I wrote and leave a space. Part two, I said, I'm gonna do this. Then I start writing, then I start writing those pieces. Uh, so it's always works out in theory, right? I start at part one. <laughs> I said I was gonna, in part one, I was gonna introduce with the context almost always. I'm gonna contextualize this problem and blah, blah, blah. So that works out pretty well, I can do that. I'm pretty experienced at writing that. Then I'll get to part two, and by the time I get to part two, I said I was gonna you know, say X, Y, Z in part two. Huh, I wonder if I was still gonna say that. I think I changed my mind. Okay, back up to the abstract. Rewrite the abstract. Rewrite the roadmap. Recopy back down into the paper. Start again. And st just fill it out, fill it in, fill it in. Each time I change the structure, this is why organiza organization is number one on my list. Each time I organize the structure, I go back up to the abstract, rewrite it again, rewrite the roadmap, reinsert the roadmap sections, and then make sure, does the paper do what I said it was gonna do? And then, you know, make sure it has a nice start and the nice conclusion, and, uh, you know, wrap it up and hopefully get it in not more than 10 days late. Well, we, we could be good at providing the, the external motivation in that regard, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure, hey, Allison, for sure. No, <laughs> yeah, no actually, you. more than once, more than once, you've sent me an email like, hey, I haven't heard you from you in a while. What are you working on? Oh, yeah, I am kind of working on a deep dive on something. Maybe there is a piece of this that I could work out in a more you know, direct fashion. And, and I will start exactly the same thing and apply it to the tax notes column. Maybe I should write uh, an article about how to write how to put together an article, but you know, it's mostly that. We know where you could publish it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much for, for walking us through that process. I think that'll be really helpful to anyone who's looking to, to kind of get started, get their feet wet in the writing process, which is a, a little intimidating. And thank you again be, for, yeah. thank you for taking the time today. Do you have any final comments of, about your article, 
student writing, writing in general, anything you just wanted to add? Well, I can say that the world of ideas is really an inspired and rare world. It's, it's hard because it's worthwhile spending time in that world. Um, and a lot of people will try to push you out of that world. Well, it's, you can't do this. It's not practical or it's not going to work or I don't understand it. I don't like it. Or that's not how we do things or that's not how we've always done things, you know, uh, but the world of ideas uh, is one in which you say, what if we did that anyway? What does that look like? And I appreciate nothing more than seeing someone playing in that world and sharing that with me. So I love to write because I am working as much as I can in that world of ideas and I want to engage other people there. It's a great place to be. And I love to see students try to jump in there. So I just encourage it. I want, I would love to see just more writing by everybody all the time. And since that's not possible, um, you know, just reach out, talk, talk through your ideas with people and develop your voice because, you know, everybody that's in this business, you know, has something to contribute, whether you can write it in a tweet or you can write it in a long form article. I sort of, I accept both, both forms. And I just love that idea that we can meet together in that world of ideas. Well, that's, that's a view that definitely reverberates with me and, and I think with many others as well. And I think they'll really appreciate everything you had to say. And of course, reading this article and others that you have. Is, is there anywhere you might want to direct our listeners to that they might be able to find you? Um, oh, yeah, handle, so for sure. Yeah. So I put all of my articles, links to everything I, uh, that's available online on my website, which is allisonchristians.com. I'm on Twitter at Prof Christians. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me there. I'm on Instagram, but you know, I barely post anything there. Uh, but uh, mostly I hang out in the pages of Tax Notes International, read my next article, whatever that might be. Yeah. And I was going to say, you can certainly find that at, at taxnotes.com and there you go. here on our, our YouTube page, Tax Analyst. So thanks again, Allison. Thank Always you. great to talk with you and hope to speak with you again soon. It was a real pleasure. Thanks so much. And now, coming attractions. Each week we highlight new and interesting commentary in our magazines. Joining me now from her home is Acquisitions and Engagement Editor-in-Chief Faye McRae. Faye, what will you have for us? Thank you, Dave. In Tax Notes Federal, Stephen Giordano explains how to navigate the rules on real estate investment trusts regarding investments that are not readily classifiable as either debt or as equity. Paul Oosterhuis and Moshe Spinowitz argue that the taxation of royalties received from controlled foreign corporations is one thing that Treasury got right with the foreign tax credit system under the TCJA. In Tax Notes State, Ted Friedman, Michael Hilkin, and Peter Hall discuss the current state of procedural affairs in New York regarding COVID-19. Darian Shansky and David Gamage discuss how states could borrow funds in the absence of federal aid during the COVID-19 pandemic. In Tax Notes International, Rick Miner discusses the European Commission's recently issued tax action plan. Tatiana Falco considers how to achieve a coordinated approach to the uniform application of unilateral digital services taxes. And on the opinions page, Martin Sullivan examines the economic stimulus effect of President Trump's executive memorandum on deferral of payroll taxes and provides possible answers to several open questions about the move. You can read all that and a lot more in the pages of Tax Notes Federal, State, and International. That's it for this week. You can follow me online at TaxDo, that's S-T-E-W, and be sure to follow at Tax Notes for all things tax. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for a future episode, you can email us at podcast at taxanalyst.org. And as always, if you like what we're doing here, please leave a rating or review wherever you download this podcast. We'll be back next week with another episode of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Notes Talk is a production of Tax Notes. You can learn more about us by visiting www.taxnotes.com slash podcast. When major media wants the straight story, they turn to Tax Notes. Thank you for listening and join us again for another edition of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Analyst Inc. does not provide tax advice or tax preparation services. Nothing in the podcast constitutes legal, accounting, or tax advice. A full disclaimer is included in the transcript.